We'll call this meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Lister, would you call the roll, please? Present. Present. We will entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session. Uh, Mr. President, I move the board recess to executive session to discuss individual employee contracts and performance pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception and the open meeting will resume at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, Reverend Williams. We have a motion, do we have a second? Thank you, Ms. Stuart Campbell. Any discussion on the motion to adjourn? I don't see any, so we're ready to vote on that, Mrs. Lister. Thank you, we're adjourned until 6.30. We'll uh, reconvene this meeting um, and uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we should have on our Zoom tonight, uh, Mrs. Pomeroy. So Mrs. Pomeroy, if you're on, uh, if you would please introduce our student tonight and uh, as we enter the Pledge of Allegiance, Mrs. Pomeroy. Good evening, everyone. I would like to introduce our Jardine Elementary Scholar. We have Cadence here with us tonight. She's a second grader from Mr. Snook's class. Her mom is Mrs. Corey Hare, who is our Jaguar Academy coordinator. So Cadence, if you could lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Hello. I. Keep going. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Cadence. Um, next on the agenda is adoption of the agenda. We'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Mr. President, I move the board approve the agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Stuart Campbell. We have a motion. Any seconds? Dr. Morrison offers a second. Any discussion? I don't see any, so Mrs. Lister, we're ready to vote. Thank you. We next get to have our senior of the month from Topeka West High School. Yes, Mr. Board President and board members, we are delighted to have with us tonight the senior of the month who is from Topeka West High School. 
Mr. Colin Cathy is going to join us online and introduce our student, Xavier Noriego. So Mr. Cathy, um, I believe, should be Good evening. Uh, tonight, I'd like to take a few minutes or a few moments, not minutes, just moments to introduce Xavier Noriega. Um, he has been actively involved in Topeka West uh, in Stucco, cheerleading, theater, track, National Honor Society, Spanish Club, Pay It Forward Club, and the Superintendent's Advisory Council. Um, in addition, his, in the senior year, Xavier was uh, nominated for Homecoming King candidate by his peers. Um, after graduation, Xavier plans to pursue a master's degree in social work, um, either attending the University of Kansas or Washburn University. Um, he is still undecided as to where to attend. I am Xavier Noriega and I am a senior at Topeka West High School. Xavier is one of the first students I met when I got at Topeka West a couple years ago. Um, and from day one, he was open to new changes. He was open to new ways of learning. Um, he's also been super enthusiastic about everything. Um, he's always engaged and always looking for new ways to be engaged in what we're singing and what we're doing. Um, I really tried to get myself involved, especially as a freshman. I wanted to give myself something to do, um, especially because not a lot of freshmen like to get involved, but. I just wanted to get out there and make sure people knew who I was. Xavier has been dedicated to his education, uh, making sure that he is opening up the possibilities for his future. Um, even when school is in a difficult situation like this year, he is taking advantage of his opportunities to ensure that he is gaining his educational opportunities um, at, every opportun at every chance he gets. So after high school, I plan to get my master's in social work and I am debating on going to Washburn or KU. So my time at West, I've really learned to balance school, home life, and work. Um, currently working two jobs and being involved in school and especially having a lot of work, taking honors classes, AP classes, it's a lot to keep up with and it's definitely helped me grow mentally and accept responsibility. So I definitely think that it'll really help me in college when it comes to that stuff. He has always been a person that has believed in me, whether I believed in myself or not. He is always there for students and me especially. Um, I'm in two of his classes, and it's, it's, it's the highlight of my day being in his class. All right, so Mr. Noriega, the reason I called you to my office today was to let you know that you have been selected as Topeka West Student of the Month for the month of November to appear at the school board. Period. With Xavier, anything is possible. Like, this kid can, can do anything that he puts his mind to. Um, he really loves the performing arts, obviously. That's something that, that we do together. He was in our musical last year. but. Honestly, anything. He's just, he's such a nice kid and he's such, just such an engaging kid. Someone who can work with just about anyone. He could literally do anything in the world. It, you know, he is a unique individual um, and true to himself. I would definitely say to the senior class, keep going. You are almost there. This is the beginning of a whole new chapter and we're almost done. So just keep pushing. You are not alone and you have, or you always have someone there for you and just keep going. Oh, nice. Very nice. Exactly. I'm so excited uh, to be able to meet you this evening. Um, I can only imagine the joy that you have brought to your family and, uh, and to all of those that you interact with. Um, our board members are here tonight, so they may want to have, they may have a, a few questions in mind for you. So, Dr. Mickelson? Does anyone have any questions for Xavier? Ms. Stuart Campbell. Start with you. So Xavier, we heard, well, congratulations. We heard that you are also involved in Spanish club. Pues habla español? Yes. Okay, te felicito, uh, estamos oh. muy orgulloso. <laughs> I'm not the only one on this board that speaks Spanish either. So <laughs> anyway, we're very, very orgulloso. Very proud of you, congratulations. Thank you guys. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Xavier? Mrs. Bowley. As I listen to you, I'm just so impressed with all the things that you are doing and two jobs, AP classes, school. I, you are incredible. And I hope you understand how impressive you are to everybody and why you actually got this award this time. You are, you're blowing me away and 
I really love the encouraging words you had for your seniors because it is an unusual year and it is so kind of you to encourage them like that and say, this is just one chapter of our lives. The rest of our lives is ahead of us. So that is such wonderful, encouraging words. Thank you for saying them to your fellow students. Thank you. We can certainly see why he was chosen. Dr. Morris, <laughs> Xavier, um, are your parents or guardians close by or are you by yourself there? Um, my mom, she's in her room, she's watching her room, so. <laughs> she's watching um, virtually, is that correct? Yes. Very good. What? What are your parents, uh, what, what's your mom's name and? Uh... Uh, her name is Jill. We lost you there for a minute. Can you repeat that? Yeah, her name is Gina. Well, we want to give her congratulations as well. Um, um, we know that um, students um, have a lot of help all the way through school. So congratulations to them. And we're very pleased that you're thinking about KU. That's uh, uh, on this board, uh, there's, there's a lot of purple and not very much uh, KU. So uh, we hope that uh, falls in place for you. So congratulations. My purple tie on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Mr. Kathy, could you run down that list of all the activities uh, Mr. Noriega has been involved with? I thought the list, you know, what I loved about it was he started, he recognized he wanted to be involved as a freshman and continued on through your senior year. I think I saw you in the musical last year. I can't remember which, I remember seeing the musical. I just don't remember you specifically, but um, a wonderful experience to see that. So Mr. Kathy could just run down that list of activities again. It was a diverse list between theater, music, and sports. and So he's been involved in uh, student council, cheerleading, theater, track, National Honor Society, Spanish Club, Pay It Forward Club, Student Advisory Council. I'm sorry, the stu Superintendent Student Advisory Council. And that's an impressive list. And I just encourage you next year as you uh, figure out where you're going to go to college, you can stay involved. And, and it makes uh, that experience is so much greater. So congratulations to you and this great accomplishment and good luck to you in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kathy. Thank you, Xavier. I think we have next, um, <clears throat> Mr. President, the proclamations to celebrate this month. Right. So with the proclamations tonight, uh, I know we have Ms. Wallace on. Uh, tonight, we are recognizing uh, Native American Heritage Month, and we have Ms. Wallace, uh, who uh, have some individuals who will read our proclamation. Ms. Wallace. Good evening, um, board. I would like to introduce um, Ms. Jennifer Bagshaw. She is our coordinator for um, Indian Education, and she's here tonight to read the proclamation. And we also have with us Amy Minor and Yale Taylor, who... Um, organize and coordinate our summer Indian education program. So, Ms. Bagshaw. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Uh, the Proclamation Topeka Unified School District Number 501, Native American Heritage Month, November 2020. Whereas Topeka Public Schools wishes to commemorate the sacrifices of indigenous people or Native American Indians across this great land from the time and memorial, excuse me, memorial up to the, up to and including the 21st century. And whereas during the month of November, we take the time to reflect upon the contributions made in the past, to celebrate the peaceful coexistence of the present and to eagerly anticipate our future as we proudly accept the gifts continually given for the members of the Native American Indians, including students in the Topeka Public Schools. And whereas we offer various methods and modes of instruction to give all students the opportunity to learn and to experience indigenous cultures in fields of music, dance, art, science, ecology, literature, economics, politics, and others. And we strive to incorporate these contributions into our everyday lives. 
And whereas the Board of Education staff and students of Topeka Public Schools wish to honor the Native American Indians and their, nation, their nations throughout this land. Now, therefore, let it be it resolved that Board of Education of Unified School District Number 501, Topeka, Kansas, does proclaim November 2020 as Native American Heritage Month in Topeka Public Schools. And we encourage all staff and students to join in this month of recognition and celebration. Be it further resolved that a copy of the proclamation be included in the minutes of the Board of Education meeting November 5, 2020. In witness whereof we, the Board of Education, Topeka Pup Unified School District number 501, do hereby affix the signature of our president and the official seal of the Board of Education this fifth day of November 2020. Thank you, Mrs. Bagshaw. Um, I, I especially like in the proclamation, we take time to reflect upon the contributions made in the past, to celebrate the peaceful coexistence of the present and eagerly anticipate our future. Um, that's a, appropriate words for this day and age in our society, maybe, and not only yeah. uh, with Native Americans, but uh, we're certainly uh, pleased to accept this proclamation and recognize our partnership with Native American students in our school district. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Ms. Bagshaw's mother is Nancy Kirk, former board member, longtime board member. So we wish your mother well and please say hello to her for us. So. so it was a up on the screen, there was something there. Is that? Uh, yes, on the screen, there was an article that related to indigenous people. Um, into this is Wallace, I don't know if you, Dr. Gray's um, microphone cut out a bit. He, he wondered if you wanted to speak to the article that's on the screen. I'm sorry, I was muted and couldn't unmute. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Minor um, at Jardine Middle School um, for Indigenous Peoples Day this last month. Um, had some activities in her classroom. And so um, I thought she might share a little bit about what she did with her students. And then if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Um, I did the Indigenous Peoples Day. I wanted my students to understand the contributions of Native Americans. Um, I also want them to understand that each nation or tribal nation is an individual entity and not to be lumped together each unique in their own ways. And so we have the, um, the benefit of having these wonderful cultural, cultural kits that are regional and focus on many different native nations. Um, obviously with COVID could not pass the items around, so walked them around. Um, my students also then completed a Google slide activity where they um, were looking at some artifacts, articles, and exhibits at the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. Great, thank you, Mrs. Minor. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any questions for Ms. Minor? Mr. Munoz. Ms. Minor, what got you interested in, in teaching this particular subject? She's still muted. There we go. Um, I keep being muted, sorry. <laughs> um, I 
grew up as a um, fur trade reenactor. So my whole growing up experience has been uh, traveling to different reservations with my father, um, learning different artifacts, skills, and cultural things. Um, and so as a history buff and major and, and one of my very first loves, of course, is Native American history. And I love to pass that on to my students. Well, I appreciate all of your efforts. I, growing up in Kansas, I think we must learn about, you know, those peoples who've been here for much, much longer, for, for generations, and uh, having uh, Prairie Band and, and Sac and Fox and all of these nations, which are so close to us, I think it benefit everybody to learn more about uh, the history that's been here for a much, a long, long time. So thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I don't see any, so thank you very much for the proclamation and, uh, and all you're doing for our students, Ms. Miner. Thank you. So are we ready to continue on with the agenda? I believe so. I think we're ready for 19. Well, we need to, we're probably back to public communications. I don't know that we have any, do we? We don't have any public communications. So um, next is dip, disposition of business by consent. So entertain a motion to uh, entertain that. Mr. President, I move the board approve the items of business by consent as presented and authorized. You to get on the phone, I need you to go to the other room. Oh, and authorize the board president or superintendent to sign the special project and purchasing contracts for and on behalf of the board. Thank you, Ms. Stewart Campbell. We have a motion to uh, approve business by consent. Uh, Dr. Bonebreak offers a second. Is there any discussion on any of the... I don't see any, so I think we're ready to vote, Mrs. Lister. Okay, now we're ready for uh, superintendent's report. I know that um, Dr. Anderson will be here soon, but we, we can certainly begin by thinking about item 19.1, which is the graduation rate report. We have Dr. Kipp who will be joining us here shortly. Um, I know in this district, like every other district, we greatly anticipate what these results will look like each year because that's a measure certainly of our success. And I think we have some real celebrations this year. This uh, data is um, a summary of what occurred last year, but um, Dr. Kipp has a variety of things for us to think about and some trend data. Okay, thank you, good evening. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and dive into it. This, this, these are our most current 2020 graduation rate uh, data. Um, those typically don't get finalized till October, so uh, we just finished that up. But if you look at the starting back 10 years ago, we've come a long way since uh, 2010. Uh, our district rate has kind of stabilized from the last three years, uh, and we are currently at 81.7% as a district. Uh, I always like to break it down by different demographics and subgroups, uh, gender, you know, there's always, um, even nationally, there's a higher graduation rate amongst females. So uh, we're seeing that again this year. Uh, the gap has uh, somewhat closed for this 2020 school year, but uh, right about 80%. Uh, when we look at race, there has been a little bit more heterogeneity uh, in terms of the big three, uh, African-American, Hispanic, and white. Uh, in particular, the Hispanic subgroup has experienced a pretty significant jump from uh, even five years ago, being at 86%. Uh, carrying on with kind of the subgroups, uh, our free lunch population, had a slight drop from last year. 
Same way with uh, special ed, slight decrease, but our ELL population had an incredible increase of 7% from uh, 2019. Now we're going to kind of dive into specific schools. Uh, Topeka High is very impressive in, uh, in their increase from last year. Actually, this is a historic increase for Topeka High. I tried to go back as far as I could from uh, the, the beginning calculations for uh, graduation rates. And uh, this, I believe this is the highest it's ever been at Topeka High. Topeka West, again, uh, stable at about 95%. Uh, Mr. Kathy would probably argue otherwise. They did jump up 0.1%. So that is technically an increase. So I will give them that, uh, but very impressive work at Topeka West. Highland Park, uh, you know, we've, we've seen a, somewhat of a slide over the last three years and had a slight dip from the last two years. More kids are graduating in uh, the five-year cohort than in the four-year. So uh, there's some opportunities there at Highland Park in terms of their graduation rates. Hope Street, this is another record uh, graduation rate, 83.6 uh, for a school that is, you know, traditionally uh, getting students that are behind in credits. It's always impressive and exciting to see them shoot up uh, and again since the inception of Hope Street this is the highest graduation rates they've ever experienced. Cap City, uh, you'll see a lot of variability in Cap City because some years they only have 10 or 15 students that graduate but again this is a record year for Cap City which is wonderful 72.2%. Uh, now, just to kind of summarize, these are some five highlights that I wanted to stress. Uh, one, we did have a slight increase, 846 students graduated in this uh, COVID 2020 graduation year we had. Uh, it was a slight increase from uh, last year at 81.7. And again, these uh, five schools, and I, I kind of glossed over Avondale West, Cap City, Topeka High, Avondale West, and Hope Street the largest increases in 10 years. Avondale West did jump from about 10% graduation rate to I believe 14, maybe 14.5%. 14 um, you know, these, these kids are, it's a pure credit recovery virtual kind of program and it's great to see increases in that, uh, in that program and as well as uh, enrollment increases. Uh, again, this for EL students, the English, English language learners, a record setting graduation rate at 87.2%. And a little nugget I found at Topeka West, this is their third consecutive year for 100% EL graduation rates at that school. So overall some really impressive stuff uh, going on despite the pandemic. And uh, we're really excited to see trends moving in the, in the positive direction. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Kip, Dr. Bonebrick? How do you define graduation rate? What's the numerator and denominator? Are we counting starting freshman year and ending end of senior year or start of senior year, end of senior year? What, what is it? That's a great question. And up until about 2013, 2013, uh, they changed the formula. What you're describing is a, a completion rate. So if you had 500 freshmen and you graduate 250, that's a 50% graduation rate. That's not the way they, they calculate it now. And without getting into the weeds, it's a cohort model. So um, basically you take the number of graduates this year and then in the denominator, you s sequentially subtract the dropouts from this year the junior dropouts from the previous year, the sophomore dropouts. So it factors in transitions in and out, like transfers, uh, students that leave the state. Um, for more details, I, I can certainly send you the formula, but it is it, the cohort model has been adopted by uh, the governors throughout the US uh, because states were calculated in, in a different fashion. And so now uh, 
yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of a complicated formula, but certainly, uh, you know, it's nice that we're all using the same metric now. That's true, but it seems like we're losing a lot of students and we don't know where they're going. I mean, transferring out is a, that's kind of a cop out, isn't it? Not necessarily. They transfer out of our cohort and become a cohort of another like Wichita. You know, we have a 20% mobility rate. And so if a child transfers out of our district, why should we be punished as, as that being a dropout from us when they could be a graduate from another district? But are they transferring out of our district? Are they just dropping out? No. Well, we have the individual granular data, but if they do transfer to another Kansas district or a district in another state, uh, we have to have documented evidence of that before they'll remove them from our cohort. So we have to track them and, and get verification that they're even enrolled in in high school or some other absolutely they they actually they, they'll call we had one we said transfer to louisiana they called the institution down there to verify uh of course we keep all the paperwork and backup documentation that the student actually left and enrolled and uh you know so yeah it's a very detailed audit trail that we have to keep uh, and the state monitors that from really from the beginning of October till the beginning of November, we have to turn all that paperwork in. So it would seem like we're losing people in the state of Kansas. Well, without going into any kind of demographic trends, you know, the, the birth rates and stuff like that are dropping. Uh, the city of Topeka has had a decline in, in population. Uh, I'm really anxious to see the 2020 census data, but some of the estimates you know, the state of Kansas is not dropping, but the demographics are changing. You know, baby boomers are living longer. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we might be getting a little off topic, but at the same time, uh, it's very rare to see 100% graduation rate anywhere in the United States. I think the national average is somewhat about 85%. There just always seems to be twice as many Topeka High freshmen as there are seniors. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that's that's true. You could probably argue the same about Topeka West as well. Um, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, if if you we could go into the into the details and look at those specific kids and I'd be happy to follow up uh, to show you the data you know, outside of this session. I would encourage uh, as we continue to look at graduation rate and graduation data, it is a topic that is interesting uh, to look at all of the nuances that impact the decline and or increase at various levels. And so um, beyond this conversation and the time that we have, being able to look further at what adds up to the graduation rate and the dropout rate being 5% and, and what, how do you get to that point? All of those things would be interesting. So I'd invite Dr. Bonebreak uh, and anyone else, if you'd like just a little more information just in your regular uh, meetings about um, what that looks like, uh, that'd be a, a great study group just to see that over time. Uh, and then seeing what also has worked. Uh, as Dr. Kipp just mentioned, the larger uh, freshman pool at Topeka West, as an example, they have a 95% graduation rate. And so he's uh, tracked uh, in past years a 95% graduation rate, and they're still somewhere in that range at this year as well. And he's tracked where every student goes. And so when you ask, is Topeka losing uh, population? Well, Kansas is losing. Uh, its population and Topeka is losing its population in general. Uh, and so as students leave, uh, that's another trend. Uh, but we'd love to kind of go into many of those other pieces for this evening. However, I wanted to make sure that now that the rate is final, uh, that uh, Dr. Kipp has the opportunity to highlight uh, the increases that we've seen at Topeka High and in other places, as well as highlight the overall rate for the district that has continued to uh, improve over time. Are there other questions for Dr. Kipp about graduation rate, dropout rate, um, as we um, continue to celebrate uh, 
Topeka High in particular, uh, but all of our schools that have continued to show gr growth, particularly at Hope Street as well, was I think a highlight for us this year. I think there's reason to celebrate, but we also have some questions it looks like. Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Morrison. And mine's very brief. Um, you, you talked about the national graduation rate. How do we compare statewide? Well, frankly, uh, current, current rates uh, you know, haven't been released. That's kind of why this, you're the first to hear about ours. And, you know, frankly, I haven't, ha haven't heard from other county districts yet uh, until they report to their boards. The actual uh, KSD, uh, the Department of Ed will not publish district rates probably closer to December or even January after they finalize everything. Um, so I really can't comment on what the current district or statewide rate is. Uh, I think in 2019, we're, it was about 83, 84%, just shy of the national average. If I mean, it, I'm, don't quote me on that, but that's, that's roughly the, the state rate. Yeah, that was my memory as well. Um, and I, I, we should congratulate our administration. I mean, we are approaching the state rate start. And if you look <laughs> way back and uh, at the beginning when we're counting, uh, we've really come a long way. Um, so, um, and that back when we started on the board, we, we knew we were doing the right things, but we just couldn't see it. And now we're seeing it. So congratulations administration. I think one of the things I know Topeka West has implemented several years ago and continued on with Mr. Kathy's leadership, I think is just that weekly meetings where they talk specifically about students and, and those students who might be kind of on the cusp of success or, or not having great success at graduation. And so I think the focus on those kids has been, uh, has shown some reward. Um, quickly, Dr. Kip, when I look at the, I had the same question last year and I don't, know, I don't remember the answer, but when I look at the numbers, I'm still a little confused at how we get an average of 82% when our two largest high schools are Topeka High is in, above 90 and Topeka West is 95 and Highland Park is almost at 80. Um, how come our average isn't higher? Because you can't, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, you can't average the average of a cohort model uh, it's just mathematically not possible. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is like Avondale West, you know, have, while they increase, they're, they're still at, you know, 14, 15% graduation rate. So we so, have a total all seniors, and if they graduate, then they're in the, uh, in the equation. It's, we take the average of all the schools and then average those? No, we do not. No, the, the, the former of what you said. Uh, all seniors, graduating seniors, are in the numerator for the district formula. All dropouts or non-graduates are in the denominator. And again, that's a cohort, freshman dropouts, sophomore dropouts, et cetera. Oh, that uh, takes into account Dr. Bonebreak's concern about the number of kids who might drop out, I guess, maybe. I'm just still struggling with it, maybe. I think- a a work group might be in order. I think uh, I'd love, you know, I could talk about this for hours, but I know uh, y'all. Uh, <laughs> I'm just struggling to get, how do you get at 81.7% when you have, um, you know, our two largest high schools are 10 or 15 points higher than that. So um, it seems like the average should be higher, but. And Dr. But I, Mickelson, I asked the same thing. I even <laughs> had him call the yeah. state to check that formula because we were just celebrating that over I'm, 90%. I'm happy to celebrate and not question the numbers. <laughs> and but I, we, we wondered the same thing because, you know, I thought that we would be uh, at 90% because our schools, our two largest schools are above 90%. And as Dr. Kip uh, shared that uh, formula, I think this really is, you know, college and career readiness is one of our main pillars uh, in our goals. And I think this really is, uh, a work group that should be had in terms of just us spending some time or, or perhaps doing a retreat um, to really look at not only that, but uh, you just mentioned the weekly models that we have in the senior spreadsheets, things that maybe not everyone knows yet because they're new on the board or maybe some current board members might want more information on. 
I would uh, suggest that for our next retreat, college and career readiness and what we're doing, especially with uh, COVID and the pandemic and seeing how are we gonna make sure kids continue to stay on track. Um, and this uh, being one of those, the formula itself, I think all of that would be helpful. Uh, in addition to what's not counted, you know, such as GEDs, um, all of those things would be helpful to uh, have some discussion about if I could suggest that as a retreat topic for our next retreat. I, I think uh, that'd be a good, good topic so we can focus on that. We know life is better with a high school degree. And uh, we used to hear about five-year graduation rates. We don't hear that anymore. So, so maybe that would be helpful to, for the new board members to kind of understand what we're required to do and how we're, how we're doing it and how we calculate it. That Definitely. sounds great. So let's put that on the agenda for our next retreat. Are there any other, Mrs. Bowley? So I'm just really impressed with the ELL graduation rate. And so I'm wondering what, what is that department doing that is creating such a great success and something that we can emulate in, in um, our other groups? Well, and I'm going to ask and see if Ms. Curry is online because she certainly can speak to it given it's her department. But one of the items uh, as we check and see if she's online, the other one of the items that I will tell you that senior spreadsheet looks at every single student. We have the data consult every month, but every school each week looks at that. Now, one of the major changes a few years ago uh, was making sure that ELL services were provided at all of the high schools. At one time, when I first started, the ELL services, if a student needed those ELL services, they had to go to Highland Park. And uh, we adjusted that practice. In fact, uh, Mrs. Stuart Campbell and I were just talking about how do we continue to do that within our middle schools as shown in our strategic plan. But in learning that all the students originally went to Highland Park, which at the time, uh, was still uh, developing in the area of their graduation rate, uh, making sure that students, when they left uh, their school, they had that access at the very next high school. So each school now serving EL students, uh, they now have access to what all students would have in their cohort group in their neighborhood. Um, so that's one major systemic change uh, outside of that. Uh, and I'll stop for a minute to see, is Ms. Curry on? Oh, she's not on with us this evening. So we'll bring that back as well with our work group in terms of other items, unless Ms. Wallace wants to address uh, anything else regarding EL. Oh, and I forgot Wallace is joining online on the uh, screen as well. Ms. Wallace, are there other items uh, regarding EL that you'd like to address? Um, no, not specifically at this time that you haven't covered. So we'll add that piece to the work group so you can hear specifically the, um, uh, some of the strategies, but the increase in EL teachers, that's one piece, and the change in making sure they can attend high school and where they live is a major piece. And then certainly those weekly meetings as well as those data consults. I'm glad you highlighted that piece. I, I have another question. So our plan for Highland Park High School, our other buildings are doing better, we're seeing progress there. So what are we planning on doing for Highland Park and our students um, there? Well, and there are two things. First of all, I do wanna mention, Dr. Kip, can you share what was Highland Park's graduation rate, let's say five years ago? Five years ago, it was 74.1%. And where was it uh, six years ago? Oh, there you go. There, we're looking at that yeah. longitudinal line. Oh, good. Okay. Yep. So, you know, so Highland Park has had kind of this up and down uh, movement to some degree. Uh, the 68% uh, back in 2010, and then seeing that they've always kind of straddled between that and 70%. So, you know, jumping to the 80% um, range for them, in part, right at that 86.9% um, for them, was right around the time um, uh, Dr. Perry came and a lot of those data consults. While Dr. New was there, the uh, Teen Pregnancy Center was put in place. So as those wraparound services were put in place and then continued under Dr. Perry, we saw continued gains. I will tell you, when we closed in March, um, students that had uh, difficulty with Wi-Fi and all of those services, uh, truly had difficulty continuing their education in a more a meaningful way. Uh, we're still pleased that the 79% uh, 
um, rate uh, is there, we would have liked to have seen it at 80%, but I'll even tell you with the 79%, many of those students came back this year to finish uh, and other students, uh, they're working now and they were uh, not desiring to return. And so, you know, I think a lot of the pandemic really impacted what this year's rate looks like, but I fully anticipate uh, that Highland Park will certainly um, be between 80 and 90% as they've been, but we, as we try to get them over that 90% uh, threshold. Uh, and if any fun from Island Park is on with us this evening, we'll have them speak to that as well. And uh, Mr. Gowan or any uh, Highland Park, Mr. Buckendorf uh, or uh, team uh, members are on. Well, Ross Eisenhower, Highland Park High School are very dear to my heart. That was my area when I taught with 501. And I always know that there's a lot of need on that side of town. And I just hope that we can find a way to find that graduation rate for them, mm -hmm. a higher graduation rate to give those um, students all the advantages we possibly can. So I'm hoping that whatever is working at the other high schools, if it can be transferred, um, whatever can happen for those students, I would really stand behind that. Yes, ma'am. And so, you know, under the equity presentation to the board, we'll uh, add graduation rate back on there. You know, talk a little bit more about EL, talk a little bit more about Highland Park and some of our highest poverty schools. So they're nearing and have in the past, at least in 2018, surpassed the state's rate and the national rate, but we certainly want to continue to see 90% and above for all of our high schools. So we'll add that to the equity presentation in the coming months. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Kip, Mr. Munoz? Not so much a, a question, but just an additional comment to add on to what, your, what uh, Ms. Bowley said is, uh, when you look at the graduation rates by race, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, uh, are we serving um, sufficiently our, our African-American students? Because we saw that drop here from 2019 to 2018. So just to add on to the, um, as we're having these discussions and, and the implications of COVID, uh, I wanna make sure we don't forget uh, these students, which by this, these stats seem to have dropped, but uh, what more can we do, so. Thank you, Dr. Kip. You bet. Thank you, Dr. Kip. And as we uh, move on to the uh, next items within our uh, agenda, uh, first of all, let me uh, apologize in that I am here and was here in the building, two meetings going at once, but I have come in at the most exciting time, one on the heels of graduation, and now a little bit about our COVID conversation. Um, and so our COVID discussion uh, this evening, and we also have our uh, athletic uh, matters. I believe uh, Mr. Colin Cathy is on with us. Yes, ma'am. Under COVID uh, conversation, this is really an open dialogue about a number of things. We're gonna start off and talk about athletics. Um, and uh, Mr. Kathy has provided a proposal for the um, fall season athletics. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Kathy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. We are looking at uh, starting fall athletic or winter athletics starting uh, November 16th. Um, we are asking the board to consider um, we, when we look at these items, uh, we looked at the high risk sports, which is wrestling. We're, at, we're looking at postponing the start of practice and competition. I'm um, at this time to reevaluate and make a final recommendation uh, for the season in, in December. Uh, with the, the increase in our community spread and then also the lack of ability for personal protective equipment to be worn during uh, wrestling. Um, makes it a large challenge right now. So we felt it's best to postpone those to, be get, to begin the season and then reevaluate and make a recommendation in December. Uh, swimming, which is a uh, low risk uh, event, uh, just to move forward with each team. We're looking at allowing each team to go move forward. Uh, practices in separate pools as uh, through, the, uh, through the, the swimming pool, we have separate entrances and then uh, moving into meets, limiting that, those meets to eight teams of 25 participants per team, um, which would allow us the, uh, to maintain the current uh, recommendations from the, health, the Shawnee County Health Department. 
uh, boys and girls basketball games. Uh, we would like to separate those out and play the boys games. Uh, our girls games on Monday and Thursday, girls or boys games on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, and then just maintain those events uh, down where we play the JV and varsity in one gym and then our freshman game in the uh, auxiliary gym. And then also follow those event plans um, as outlined, which would allow us to also include student section of 75 students. And we would help highlight that with students who are um, having academic success and engaging in class. Uh, we would eliminate seating on the first three rows of the floor to, uh, for patron safety, and then eliminate seating on the bench side of events um, is what we would be looking for to do this uh, season. And basketball is considered a moderate risk sport similar to soccer. And so at this time, Mr. Kathy, uh, uh, are you asking for your proposal at this time uh, to be approved uh, and the board's questions to be entertained at this time for all matters that you've discussed or did you wanna go sport by sport? Um, I would be ready to take questions as uh, the board sees fit. Mrs. Bowling. I noticed in the proposal that we have our home team uh, dance teams, uh, cheerleading teams, but I don't see any recommendations for visiting teams and their uh, dance and cheer sports. Our league has uh, made the recommendation of moving forward with no visiting cheerleaders. Um, so there will only be cheerleaders at home events for our events for the home team um, throughout our Centennial League. Mr. Stewart Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Cappy. My question is, I, I saw that there would be daily temperature checks and also an online COVID questionnaire. Uh, what, can you speak to that? What is this, the online COVID questionnaire? What we have done is we've created a, a Google form in which the principal and athletic director at each high school are the only ones that have access to that. It helps us with our contact tracing if a student were to um, be come positive, it allows us to kind of come down and say, okay, these are the kids that were at practice and here are the, there were, here were their answers. It helps with the contact tracing, giving back to the county. And the only two people that have access to that are the building principal and the, high, and the athletic director for that high school. Um, and it's, it records, a, they record their temperature and then they're asked, um, have you been in contact with anybody? Have you, and goes through and asks basically a screener saying, like when you walk in the doctor's office, have you been around anybody? Have you experienced any of these following symptoms? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morrison. Um, yeah, Mr. Cathy. Um, I assume if we're going to all virtual, if that happens, that all these practices and everything will stop. Is that correct? What my recommendation is that we move forward just like we did in the fall with the moderate contact sports and the low contact or the moderate risk sports and the low risk sports where they would continue to be able to practice and compete moving forward. I, I just can't agree with that. Any other questions, comments? Dr. Morrison. The other question is, uh, I know basketball is a, a minimum contact sport or a moderate, uh, <laughs> most basketball, I mean, I played basketball too. Um, the the rec CDC recommendation is 10 to 15 minutes um, within six feet. I don't think you can play basketball without being up in somebody's face longer than 10 or 15 minutes. That's my opinion. Um, unless you can test all the players, um, <laughs> they're not gonna be social distance. They're not gonna be wearing masks when they're running around. Um, so <laughs> they're at risk and that's all there is to it. And this recommendation is, also comes from what we did in the fall um, based upon our moderate and our high risk 
uh, sports and our low risk sports. So that was a derivation of where we came up with these recommendations. Yeah, we weren't uh, in the red zone in the fall sports. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Kathy, what's the plan uh, for middle school sports? Is it the same as in the fall, just like intramural? Yeah, so we'll be moving with the middle schools. Um, as long as we are not able to bring all of our students onto campuses to meet full days, um, we're gonna remain in the uh, intramural model um, this year. Okay, thank you. I noticed uh, the district recommendation is 525 maximum uh, people in the auditorium. I think the county has a 500 people recommendation for max, is that? And that'd be over two gyms. So we'd have, so when you look at this, we also have two event sites where one is the varsity and JV game. And then the second event site would be the ninth grade game, um, which would be at 645 um, in the second gym. Okay. I don't know a solution to Dr. Morrison's concerns. Um, what's Keisha say about this? The, the recommendation is for them to, to basically clear out those first three rows um, for the crowds. Um, you limit your cheerleaders and then they wear masks. And then because there are five players that they play, they play without masks. I would like to uh, share that the first basketball game or any game for that matter in the fall is after Thanksgiving. Is that as correct? Is, is that correct, sir? Yes, the first game would be um, in the second week or yeah, in the first week of December. Mr. Munoz. Mr. Kathy, you said that this model was was based on you know what we did with the fall and and through the fall as you came up with this, we had a lot of discussions uh, with Shawnee County. Um, the Shawnee County's health recommendations did that change at all given our where we are right now this week? This is based upon what their latest recommendations were. Um, is to maintain the small numbers in the gyms and then also to, you know, but yes, it, did, it has not updated with the, the most recent listing, but they have not released any more stri uh, restrictions on the uh, large group gatherings, which they stay at 500. So we have stayed at 500. Um, obviously this one has a 525, which um, we can reduce down to 500 pretty uh, without too much difficulty. I mean, when we're talking about 25 individuals, that's something we can cut out without too much difficulty. And Mr. Kathy, when you mentioned between two gyms, it's actually not, uh, what are the numbers actually in a gym? So, so a gym, so the main gym, it would, if, so our, so if you look at our freshman team, that is 36 players, or, uh, I'm sorry, 24 players between the two teams. So, that's 24 kids coming out of there. So, I, you know, if everybody came in and just went to the main gym and watched the main game with the athletes, that'd put us at 501. So the assumption is we're gonna have at least one parent going and watch the freshman game. And so that would be put us under 525. That'd put us under 500 in the main gym. Go ahead, Mrs. Bully. Is there any possibility at all with the predictions of the virus possibly getting worse in the in the near future? Maybe go off at you know go down further in the spring. Is Keisha thinking at all? I mean, our numbers are much different than they were in the fall. Do you know if Keisha is thinking at all about maybe postponing and rolling back seasons? Um, until our numbers come down? Not at this time. They, their latest recommendation that we received was to move forward um, as scheduled. And was there any explanation behind uh, moving forward with 
the COVID numbers as high as they are in the whole state. We're not just talking about Shawnee County. The whole state, the numbers have climbed tremendously. And so I just wondered if they're concerned at all about the numbers climbing across the state. I think that they're leaving that down to the individual school districts and schools to determine what is best for their community because of while it is statewide, there are still communities that are seeing very minimal growth, unlike what we're seeing here in Shawnee County. So there's been very little direction given from them to as, as a organization. Or wrestling, they want them to change their uniform between matches. That's their solution. Yeah, change their, change their uniforms, um, take a shower, disinfect the mats. There's just a lot of things that we'd end up having to do that, you know, we're, why we've, with that being the high risk category, we've opted it to. Wouldn't, it wouldn't stop the spread of COVID, truthfully. So uh, if I may offer some uh, next steps as a uh, couple of options, if the board is uncomfortable with addressing this at this time, uh, again, the first game is not until later in November and uh, after uh, Thanksgiving. And while practice would have normally picked up uh, at the very end of November, the next uh, board meeting certainly is prior to uh, any next steps that offers the board an opportunity to look at the scorecard again. Uh, that would be one option. Uh, and that may uh, delay movement at this time uh, and an opportunity to look at that. Uh, the second uh, option, uh, if I may offer this, that each sport is listed out here and we could uh, proceed perhaps with some of the recommendations that are listed. If you are comfortable with some of those recommendations and acting on those, uh, that by sport, if you'd like to act on those at this time, uh, that you feel like um, have less uh, risk and, uh, and then for others, if you'd like to delay that. Uh, so I'll turn it back to the board to see what your pleasure is uh, regarding some next steps uh, for Mr. Kathy this evening. Mr. Kathy, could you walk us through the swimming and diving again? I, I looked at the basketball, but didn't really get a chance to review the, the aquatic. Uh, yes, sir. So swimming and diving, um, we would be looking at uh, 25 individuals per swimming pool. So uh, each team comes at separate entrance. We have 25 individuals in each of the pools um, and then they would practice those. So right now it would be Topeka High and Topeka West each have a swimming team. Highland Park does not participate in swimming at this time. Um, if they do, then they usually do have a cooperative agreement with Topeka High School um, to where those kids would come and swim with that team. Uh, at this time, I'm unaware of any kids who are looking to come and swim with them. So we'd cap those teams at 25. Each would swim in a separate pool. Um, and come in, enter and exit out of separate entrances. So there would be no intermingling between the schools. And then when they have uh, their competition? Competitions, we met, limit that to um, eight schools, a maximum of eight schools um, coming in with 25 participants per team. Um, that would put us at 225. We'd then limit the number of tickets that we would give out to in, at Hummer Sports Park um, to go into the auditorium at 225. So that'd be two per uh, participant, keeping us at 28% and 400, actually be 450 would be our, uh, our total number of people in the building. And Mr. Kathy, if I may uh, just uh, ask, uh, is Fine arts and ban, I know that was a conversation previously regarding that. And at the time we were waiting for equipment to come in. So can you share how, how would that be handled? Fine arts and ban with the band, fine arts would continue to move forward as we've been moving um, with their virtual performances. Um, and then band would be performing, they would be at pregame, we would limit their the band size to 30. Um, and then according to uh, Keisha's recommendation, they would play a pregame uh, warm-up um, for the game, and then the students uh, would vacate that area to um, for the remainder of the game. So they would be coming in and, and performing at the games. Dr. Morrison. Yeah, Mr. Kathy, um, I know Chris 
Reynolds um, has helped with things that will allow instruments to play without spewing the 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 small dispersion things like covers for the tubas and <laughs> and all the brass instruments and split masks for so those will be in place when the band plays i mean yes sir yeah they would be wearing they still be wearing the protective equipment maybe space six feet six to seven feet apart and that's part of the reason why we would have to limit it to 30 um, is because of those sections so we could fit them into that section um, with the spacing that we would require. Those, those are very important mitigation. Um, yes. Um, and we don't want to not have our band there and allow the basketball players to. Correct. <laughs> um, but also the, the, the swimmers, I, uh, that's a fairly safe sport. Um, and I, I, I could go along with uh, swimmers if everybody I tend to agree very very careful with that uh, I mean just you know the coach has got to be uh, very cognizant of the mask thing and the social distancing thing and um, I mean swimmers tend to <laughs> get close together and um, celebrate and and you know you, you just can't do that in a pandemic so um, I, I could go with the swimming thing um, and even practice with that, but I'm not sure in a red that I could I could go along with uh, basketball to, uh, at least until, like Dr. Anderson said, for two weeks. Uh -huh. So, with that statement, if I may uh, ask, then uh, since there are some sports you feel uh, as though you're comfortable with, and others that you want more conversation about, uh, Dr. Mickelson, are you okay with? That's just going sport by sport so that uh, uh, Mr. Kathy has direction. And Mr. Kathy, um, are, are, is bowling one of our uh, fall sports? Mm -hmm. And did you want to speak to that, sir? Bowling is a winter sport. It does not start till December. Um, we are still waiting to hear back from the proprietors um, as to what they're uh, willing to do for, with us and work with us um, as we move forward for bowling. Um, and then those final recommendations from the state for bowling. Um, as with crowd limitations, there may be additional uh, fees or other things that have to come from those proprietors as those are private businesses um, that we use. So we are waiting to hear from them before we make any recommendations. So I shared that because if there are other sports during the winter that we're not bringing up at this time, there may be reasons such as that. And so we'll be coming back to you again, potentially uh, in about a month regarding some other sports as well. My apologies. Yeah, I had a question. Bowling, where, where does that fall on? Is it lower, moderate or higher risk sport? It would be a low risk sport um, from that because you have the ability to clean your ball between each roll. Um, and sterilize that. So, and then the, with the limitations, it had, I believe you have three people in your lane, three or four people in your lane. Um, and that's why we're waiting to hear from the, the proprietors to say what they're going to allow and then how we can match that with the, uh, the, the rest of what the recommendation from the activity association would be. Mr. Kathy, did I hear you correctly too that the bands would just play prior to the? That's that a, was, yes, that was a recommendation that came from both uh, from the band directors uh, was to do just just do the 20 minute pregame. And I will share, I believe Mr. Reynolds is actually online with us as well this evening. Now, I, I hopefully I am one for three because I called two other people and they weren't on just yet. But Mr. Reynolds, uh, is he on with us, Mr. Gallon? I'm going to circle back to that. And I believe either he was on and maybe he's uh, uh dropped off for a moment. So I'll, I believe we can come back to fine arts and just see if there are any other items he wants to mention because he may want to speak to that this evening. Yeah, while we wait for him to get on, it just seems to me, I would defer to their, however they want to do that. But if they wanted to go longer, I, if they're going to be doing it for 20 minutes before the game and we think it's safe then, I, I would suggest that it would be safe at halftime or whenever at timeouts. But um, you know, and it's, I'd defer to there if they, if, if they really just want to do it for 20 minutes before the game starts and go home and 
And so I'll, I'll ask him to speak to that at the end of this piece. If we can uh, ask, I'd like to ask for the wrestling, and I'm just going to read out loud what we have listed according to Mr. Kathy's proposal. Mr. Kathy is proposing, uh, and we are proposing, uh, uh, the reevaluating uh, wrestling and making a final recommendation for the season in December, and at this time, postponing the start of practice and competition for wrestling. Uh, is that uh, we'd like to ask for the board's uh, approval of that recommendation to postpone the start of practice and competition and to reevaluate that in December. Is there any discussion on that or nod your head if you think that's appropriate? We're all like we have a consensus on uh, wrestling. Uh, the area of swimming, uh, it, uh, each team will practice in a separate pool with its own entrance. In-person meets will be limited to eight of 25 participants per team. Uh, we have consensus uh, from the board on swimming. I see several head shakes and a thumbs up, so I think we're good there. It's like all board members are, uh, we have consensus on swimming. The area of boys and girls basketball games played on separate nights. Uh, it says girls games will be played on Monday and Thursday. Boys games will be played on Tuesday and Friday. Uh, the discussion this evening, uh, uh, in addition to that, that is Mr. Kathy's proposal. Uh, uh, your discussion has also been to potentially look at bringing that back to have conversation at the next board meeting. So. Uh, we'll start off with the uh, playing on Monday and Thursday and Tuesday and Friday and starting practice. That's Mr. Kathy's proposal, correct, Mr. Kathy? Yes, we'll be starting practice on uh, November 16th. And then when we get into games in December, we'll be splitting those nights. It looks like they would have just started practice before a day or two before our next board meeting if we allow that to proceed, or do we want to postpone that until... I it's been several, stated to wait. Is that see several? So the, the recommendation, I think, is to wait until the next board meeting to, to make a call on that. Is that? Okay, so board members would like for the next board meeting to add uh, basketball, and we'll see where the COVID scorecard is at that time. And uh, the area of um, the um, bowling is still TBD and bowling will be brought back. So those are all of the sports at this time. Uh, Mr. Kathy, are there other items that we need that you need direction on? And Mr. Reynolds uh, is uh, uh, on and uh, would like to, Mr. Reynolds, the question was about the band playing at the athletic games and what that would look like. Is it limited to the pregame or uh, what you anticipate that looking like? When Mr. Reynolds is done, Mr. Kathy, if there are any other items you need the board to give you uh, direction on, uh, I'll turn it back to you to get that direction. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, I will leave it to you first to share about the ban. And good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, Dr. Anderson, members of the board. So uh, Mr. Kathy and myself, uh, Mr. Bradshaw, uh, Mr. Evans, we've all been having discussion about that band and what that would look like in our current situation. Um, to, I caught the tail end of some of the discussions about uh, staying for the entire game, playing throughout what's going on. Uh, the National Federation of High School uh, State Associations is still recommending 30 minute play times with uh, bands. So even with our mitigations of wearing masks and having bell covers to reduce the, the, the risk, it's still recommended that we're doing things at 30 minutes. Um, Mr. Kathy and I had spoken in detail about alternating uh, between a boys game and a girls game to make sure that we have equity across the board of, of, of making sure that we're representing both games. So uh, we figured this would be a good solution to make sure that we're there uh, as a, uh, as a, mu a music organization and representing uh, Topeka Public Schools and then also providing that service that we do with athletics. That makes sense. I'd forgotten about the 30 minute rule, but yeah, that, that, thanks for reminding me of that. Any other questions for Mr. Reynolds, Mrs. Bully? I'm wondering if we could think about where the band is located. I know a lot of times when I've been at basketball games, the bands are up high and above me 
high spewing down on me, but I'd never thought of it before the pandemic. But maybe <laughs> having a section where they're lower and at the far end of the gym or something where they're not having spectators in front of them, if that could be an option. It, that's something that we are looking at uh, because like you said, we're usually up above and, and, and bringing our, our sound sound to the group we'll not talk about our aerosol we'll talk about the sound from above um so that is a possibility we're looking at is to making sure that we have proper placement in the in the basketball uh, court area um I, I did have an opportunity to speak with one of the directors from nfhs yesterday and just to give you an idea of how the mitigations are working uh it was announced yesterday that between bell uh, bell covers and masks, we're reducing uh, up to ninety five percent of of the the risk in 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 our mitigation. So that's a great thing nationwide that we're able to do that through the research. So we'll definitely uh, take a look at where we're standing and playing um, as as we build those plans. With that, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, we do still have uh, quite a bit under COVID conversation. So Mr. Kathy, were there other items that you need direction on this evening, sir? No, ma'am, I do not. Uh, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. He joined the district at such an exciting time in this role as AD, although he's been in the district many times. And I just have to say publicly, you are doing an exceptional job in being able to maneuver, address, and uh, prepare for the unknown. And I thank you, sir, for your uh, work thus far. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. As we look at the COVID numbers for this evening, this was posted earlier today in the Shawnee County, on the Shawnee County website. Uh, as you can see, the county is now in a red zone. Uh, in that red zone, uh, we have shared with our staff and both our parents to prepare uh, that if in fact we remain in the red zone for two consecutive weeks, that would be this week, uh, and we, they, this will be published again on Thursday. Now, keep in mind, many of our students are out for much of the week next week due to parent conferences. So we are asking that our students take their computers home with them when they leave for preparation of parent conference so that if in fact we are read next Thursday, that with Thanksgiving coming up uh, shortly thereafter, that we remain on remote learning at that time. And uh, if I have consensus from the board that the remote learning option could be in place through Thanksgiving. And at the end of Thanksgiving, if the scorecard declines out of red uh, into the orange or yellow or other areas, then we would re resume school as we normally would have done after Thanksgiving. And we have full confidence that our community will be working to reduce that number. So we are asking for the boards um, uh, at this time, we're asking just for consensus of uh, support in uh, that plan that if next week we are still red, that at this time we take the step of um, planning for remote instruction through the Thanksgiving break. Any concerns about that? Doesn't look like I see any concerns and any questions about that. Uh, we also have inclement weather and we want to talk about what remote learning means just as the reminder of what that means. Not seeing any questions. Remote learning, uh, previously, if you recall, we started the year in remote. So remote learning would be at home with the device and learning uh, at home because of the red uh, number. So they're, they're, that they would be totally remote through Thanksgiving. So that's what that means. That's not a hybrid model. That's not an in-person model. So that's for clarity for all of us to know what that looks like. Uh, we will be giving our parents a weekly update. So Friday, they'll get the COVID communicator, which will have the Shawnee County card. It also will have our internal district card uh, measuring what our uh, rate has been during the same time period of Shawnee County. And we're doing that to allow people to see here's where the county is 
And then how many cases have we had during that same time in Topeka Public Schools? So that will be posted on Friday as it's been done in, past, uh, in the past uh, several weeks. The other item we'd like to talk about is inclement weather uh, and entertain questions regarding inclement weather. Uh, at this time, as you know, the uh, calendar was adjusted because we started later in the year. That calendar was created uh, by the KNEA and they did tremendous work on developing uh, a calendar that we could utilize uh, to ensure within that calendar we do not have to make up snow days after um, uh, June, uh, during the month of June and to ensure our seniors acquire enough hours in the uh, full school year and can graduate in May, uh, we are suggesting that snow days uh, or uh, inclement weather days, what was previously known as snow days, uh, be remote learning days. Uh, we now have the opportunity for young people to take their devices home. Secondary students already do that. Uh, we would uh, make the call regarding snow days uh, in part based on the forecast, which we do partially now. Uh, normally we drive the roads and those other items. This year we are concerned that given the pandemic, we would uh, truly not want to uh, be in a position in which buses are delayed or um, there are buses that can't make it to a stop due to weather. So we will be very... Uh, diligent in um, calling the inclement weather day early uh, this year uh, to be as safe as possible. And based on calling it early, the principals at the elementary can have students take their computers home. And those inclement weather days, learning can continue uh, rather than having added gaps of learning over time uh, in the month of December or January and sometimes in February. Uh, but should we have inclement weather, we'd like to have some level of learning continue rather than students just staying home uh, without that engagement. Are there questions about that? And is there a consensus uh, of agreement on allowing learning to continue where possible remotely? Uh, and that would also allow us to honor the calendar without disruption uh, or addition at the end of June. Mrs. Bowley, do you have questions? I know we established a new calendar after um, our school year started. Did we give up some of our uh, snow days or inclement weather days during that time? Um, I know we only have, what is it, three? Yeah, and I'll have uh, Ms. Wallace and uh, Mr. Robin speak to that. So Ms. Wallace, uh, uh, does the fantastic job of leading the calendar committee, which she just started this past week to get back started for next year's calendar. Ms. Wallace, can you share the adjustment in the calendar and did we adjust or lose snow days and talk about that a little bit? Um, yes, so uh, the calendar that was adjusted now currently gives us, um, I believe, three snow days. We generally have um, closer to five to six days built in. And um, the, the, real, the real issue and concern is around seniors because we push the start date back. Um, we have to get in their hours prior to um, graduating in May. And so while there are some days built in, there aren't days built in for um, seniors uh, for the purpose of graduation hours. And so that would be one of the reasons um, we would want to use inclement weather days as remote days. And Mr. Robbins, I know that you're on regarding snow days and if there's a reduction in what's uh, utilized in there uh, generally. Do you want to add to that? I think that Ms. Wallace covered it pretty well. You know, usually there was uh, uh, three that we could do, uh, sometimes more, you know, without requiring for those days to be made up. Um, but uh, as she said, you know, the concern this year uh, has to do with our seniors and making sure that they're in a position to uh, graduate on time. This may be one of the benefits of COVID, remote learning, eliminating 
these days without education? So at this time, uh, Dr. Munoz or Mr. Munoz? Yep, my question is, um, when we adjusted and we reworked these uh, the calendar days, um, what was the process of, of teacher input, whether, whether it was the KNEA or I mean, at the, any local yes. NEA, but how's that process work? Ms. Wallace, can you share the process of the adjusted calendar, how that was made and, and who helped make that? Uh, Ms. Wallace, I think you're still on mute. So our current calendar that was revised is um, uh, was developed by KNEA. When we knew we were pushing the start date back 18 days, we wanted um, to give NEA the opportunity to have voice. And so they proposed the current calendar. Um, we reviewed it to make sure that it had um, the KSDE requirements um, and it did. And so uh, that's kind of how that calendar came to be. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wallace, for that. I just, one of the things that I worry about is that um, I understand the pressures we have to, within our calendars, to make sure that our, our graduates, our students, seniors have the requisite number of hours to be able to graduate. But I also understand that the, some of these decisions are, are tough, um, and especially for our teachers who bear the brunt of, of you know, the, the, the responsibility and that extra work. So I just, I just want us to be cognizant that it, we are asking more of our teachers um, under already difficult circumstances. Well, and thank you, Mr. Munoz. Now, Mr. Robbins, I do want to ask um, that um, with the uh, inclement weather days generally, uh, as in last year, uh, we had more inclement weather um, than we thought we would have. And if we have too many days, that does require us to make those up in June as we take inclement weather, as we have those inclement weather days. Is that correct? And I see you, Mr. Robbins. I don't see myself on the screen, but as I, I, I do now see you. So can you share that, uh, please? That, that is true, uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, we do have to, uh, and we would have to, in this case, go further into June if we had to make up those inclement weather days. Um, I do know that it is the desire uh, of most of our uh, staff, if not all, uh, that we not go any further into June than what we already have planned uh, on the revised calendar. Uh, and by doing the remote uh, teaching on the inclement weather days, uh, if and when they occur, uh, that would prevent us from having to do so. Thank you. And then, with that as well, uh, any other questions? So, you know, one of the co comments we had is if we have, you know, too much inclement weather, do we want to make those days up in June? And emphatically, the answer was no. Teachers do not want to make up any days. And if there's any possibility of having to make up any day at any time, they would rather not. Therefore, um, normally teachers um, would be uh, planning to be in school having instruction. Therefore, uh, they still would have instruction in school as they were planning to do anyway. Um, so allowing for the gaps that we've had up to now and the interruptions up to now to not continue over time, especially if we're going to be um, more diligent about having potentially more snow days uh, due to, uh, and we might not, but if we really believe the forecast is problematic and we have a lot of winter weather, we want the leeway to be able to have those days without too much worry about missing uh, instructional time. Uh, so I'm just looking for consensus in that regard. Uh, if, are there any concerns regarding that? Looks like everyone is on the same page with that. All right, as we move on to the next area. And again, thank you, Mr. Gowan, for uh, pulling up all of our cameras so that we can see uh, Ms. Doc Dr. Hackett, myself, and all the board members uh, uh, this evening on the screen. We do appreciate you uh, turning on all the cameras. Dr. Anderson, can I just interject one, go back a, a moment to fine arts. And if 
if we have data that the, the mitigation uh, things we've purchased will minimize aerosolization by 95%, that's, that's probably as good as a mask, I would guess. It seems like fine arts ought to have a little more latitude to participate in some of those activities that they've traditionally been able to participate in. I know there's a 30 minute limit um, before they have to vacate. And I know we've, you know, I know to the guys going to Grace Cathedral, I think to do some things back and forth for singing and whatnot, but it seems like drumline probably, you know, they're wearing a mask and drumming. They ought to be able to participate, you know, provided social distance and the mask wearing, right? And if, if the instrument covers cover and prevent spread of 95% of aerosols, the aerosol droplets. Oh, with that, well, and that, I see that's Ms. what I'm thinking. Mr. So, Reynolds is still here. And so can you repeat the question so Mr. Reynolds yes. can address that or the suggestion? So Mr. Reynolds, thank you for uh, staying on and answering this question. So if the mask or the, the, the bell covers or whatever we've purchased to mitigate aerosol distribution at the end of a uh, brass instrument, for example, is that the equivalent of a mask? Um, especially when a person is wearing the mask to begin with, so most of their aerosol would go into the instrument and if the oh. if something at the end of the instrument. So I'm just wondering if there's a little more latitude with that 30 minute rule for for pet bands and those kinds of things, drum lines obviously seems like they ought to be able to participate without a lot of limitation, except for maybe mask wearing and social distance. So I'm just curious, um, you know, concerts or fall concerts if in a big auditorium, um, I don't know, I get, I'm just looking for more clarification, I guess. Well, I, I appreciate the... <laughs> I hope that person's wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah, I hope they're wearing a mask and as it well. Was not because we're talking about fine arts. So, what a little bit of music, <laughs> right? When we're talking about fine arts, <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, sir. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate the the questions, and and that's where we're running into uh, ongoing research because right now the. Um, the, the data that is being received in is in a controlled environment within um, a basically what a classroom would would look like. Um, so there's uh, NFHS, uh, University of Colorado uh, and, and University of Maryland are still doing some research. Um, as far as being able to have concerts, um, we don't we don't have a lot of information about how audiences uh, uh, add to that. Um, Quite frankly, yes, we could have drumline and strings, but uh, we haven't explored uh, indoor uh, performances of much of anything lately. Um, it's like, like I said, it's an ongoing uh, concern and question that we're looking into. I'm, I'm not completely comfortable having an indoor auditorium concert necessarily. I'm not, but I, I think we need to explore it because if we're gonna let basketball play with 500 or swimming play with 425, I mean, you could do a voucher um, for the concert and, and maybe rent a larger space. I don't know. I'm just. Um... So if I may propose, uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, is there a time period when you think you may be able to return? I know the next board meeting we'll be talking about and looking at basketball and that scorecard. Is that a time in which the fall um, uh, fine arts matters can uh, be revisited based on what you do know at that time? And for the things that you aren't fully well versed on, you certainly can come back in December as well, but um, is that something that you can continue this uh, presentation at the same time? It seems like that would be a good time as we're talking about other indoor activities. Is that okay, sir? Absolutely. We have uh, kind of brought this up with our staff that we are gonna reevaluate um, after uh, the new year uh, so we could review some more data uh, that and be able to prepare for concerts. So our staff has been told in January is when we would revisit the policies. So we'll have- I would uh, love for that to happen even sooner. Just, you know, so much of their senior year for our musicians has been lost. And, and I just, I wanna make data-driven decisions just like everybody does. And 
if there's data out there that would suggest that it could happen with the mitigation devices that have been purchased and implemented, then I'd love to see that happen. So absolutely. So the next uh, board meeting will bring that back along with the other indoor activities. And to your point, anything that can uh, engage our young people. Uh, and one thing, <laughs> help them, you know, a lot of people for, especially for drumline, if you've heard kids talk about drumline, strings as well, that things that cause for young people want to remain engaged that they're looking forward to, uh, we'd love to be able to see that uh, highlighted and uh, allowed. So, uh, Mr. Reynolds, we look forward to seeing you at the next board meeting as well uh, in November. And if you have a proposal prior to then, if you can, uh, we'll certainly get that to the board if there's a proposal prior to that time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be great. So on the inclement weather, uh, we uh, have kind of concluded our uh, request, which uh, right now is just to look at remote days. And I just want to make sure that's a head nod for that continued uh, learning. One of the things that we will look at for remote learning um, sometimes we have remote learning because of icy weather or um, in addition to snow. Um, before students go home, uh, if they're secondary, they can download their uh, information on the desktop. And so again, based on forecast, we'll be diligent in doing that. Ms. Wallace has been exploring uh, how we make sure offline young people can also use their elementary materials uh, so that they can have that offline as well. One of the reasons why that's important is that even if we don't have ice, if someone has an issue why they don't have a broadband or internet or fast enough speed, we want them to have the access to uh, materials that they can continue to use and videos. Um, so moving from there, uh, we want to open this discussion up for our board members to have conversation about any COVID uh, related matters. Um, since we now know we're going to revisit uh, next Thursday the scorecard, and if we are uh, red, uh, allow, since we're so close to the Thanksgiving break, for students to remain remote. And then uh, we will look at the next scorecard, and if we have declined, we will uh, suggest that our students return back to school. That's our final item to bring to you. We'll open this up if you have questions about COVID, other COVID matters that we need to address? So just from a perspective of communication and timing, we get the COVID numbers from the county on Thursday, typically is that Thursday afternoon? That is correct. We receive it uh, right around uh, between 11 and 12 o'clock generally. So we know right now we're uncontrolled and deep red. Um, so we, we will send electronic devices home with the kids at next Wednesday, Wednesday. when they leave first for uh, parent teacher conferences. And then Thursday we will communicate whether they need to come back in person on Monday or stay home and do remote. That is correct. We anticipate as soon as uh, we, we learn what the scorecard is uh, pretty much all around the same time. So uh, us and parents may see it published as well right around the same time. So Thursday or between uh, around around 12 o'clock or so. And uh, as soon as it's published, we'll share the new scorecard. And if it is declined, then we will you know, look forward to seeing our students back the very next week. If, the, uh, if we're still at a very high red rate uh, and we're seeing direct impact to our district, uh, which we're beginning to uh, see that, uh, then we will uh, remain remote through Thanksgiving. We will give an additional update that following week on Thursday again, as soon as the card is posted, uh, because we do want to have students uh, at school, in school, and remain engaged continuously is the goal uh, when it's safe to do so. So every Thursday, uh, if we are at a remote state, uh, we will be updating our families regarding uh, returning. Okay, thank you. I did participate in a conference call with Dr. Pazino on Saturday morning. He was alarmed because the number of positive cases was overwhelming his department and they had 90 positive cases on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, they also, um, the, the percentage of positive case rate I think is in double digits now. So every, they're getting, I forget the number, I looked at it earlier today, I forget what the number was, but 
I want to say 12 or 13% of the people who are tested are testing positive where historically we've been in the, in the mid single digits. So just encourage our, our community members to help us out um, and stay safe. Mr. Munoz. Yeah, just uh, one more thing, just, just to make sure I, I remember correctly in our conversations. Um, so students may stay home, you know, depending on next week and, and that the scorecard. Um, and remind me again, uh, teachers, do will they be coming in or will they uh, have the option to be able to stay if, if they feel it's uh, risk, too risky for them? They will have the option, which is what we did initially. We pretty much shared that if a teacher would like to come into the building and work from their classroom, they can, and some teachers prefer that. If they uh, would prefer and can, and not just teachers, staff who can work from home and they can manage their work from home, uh, that we will uh, be allowing that as well. And that's during the remote uh, working uh, period for clarity. Dr. Anderson, do we feel we need the lead time to bring students back that we do to go to remote? Will we have a, like, um, right now we're giving parents a lead time that we're concerned that we'll have to go to remote. Will we be automatically be able to come back or do we give a lead time for a return to school? You know, generally, uh, much like the Thanksgiving break or spring break or any other item, um, you know, we're telling parents now this plan so that they know that when we, uh, in Thanksgiving, we're planning to return to school as they normally would from Thanksgiving if those numbers have declined. Uh, so that we keep our young scholars into a continuous cycle of remaining in school, which is our goal. Um, so um, the lead time to get childcare is quite complicated for many families, which is why we're sharing now for those that need childcare that if we are red, we could have a possibility of being remote. We also want people to know that um, uh, to do everything they can to help us reduce the COVID numbers, which is another reason why we're giving advance notice so that they know what could happen if in fact, we remain in a red state uh, for consecutive weeks. Uh, but telling people now that as soon as we uh, move out of red, we want our students to remain in school continuously uh, as soon as possible and to return back to school uh, for the upcoming Monday, again, because those scores come out on the Thursday. Just to put this in perspective, I just looked it up on the Shawnee County Health Department website. They had, Dr. Pazino was alarmed at 92 last Friday. Today, it's 170 positive cases. So it's the highest it's been in a long, probably forever, so. Dr. Morrison. Um, just a thought. Um, of course, Thanksgiving in itself lends itself to uh, families getting together, bringing people in from out of the area, uh, and possibly spreading the virus. Um, so, I mean, if we are, and I kind of think that we're going to be going um, virtual after next Thursday when we get, I, I can't believe that all of a sudden it's going to go back to orange. I don't know that, but um, might we consider um, at least going to the first week of December or something and see what's going on at that time rather than bringing them back immediately following Thanksgiving, just because we don't know what's going to happen during Thanksgiving. And it may be totally worse and it may not. I don't know. I mean, it's unpredictable. And the other thought would be going to Christmas break virtually. And we, Mara, we, we, uh, we will, when we come back, we'll certainly uh, give all of those things consideration. However, I will share with you some of the um, uh, areas of concern regarding being remote for an extended period. Uh, our principals and our parents as well and students have expressed uh, concern about uh, extended periods of remote learning, uh, disengagement, uh, lack of internet access and or broadband services, and the lack of ability to have uh, the level of engaging instruction that we have um, 
uh, we know we can have in person. During our in-person learning, uh, we uh, did experience some um, uh, holidays. We returned back to school right after Labor Day and um, we saw that the numbers uh, continued to decline for a period of time. And while it moved back and forth between yellow and orange, uh, the holiday didn't necessarily uh, increase uh, uh, that. So we, again, uh, believe that by letting uh, families and community members know that our goal is for in-person and if they uh, don't work together to bring those numbers down, uh, we will have to be remote. We hope that that message is one that um, uh, ensures a level of um, compliance to the extent that we need it to be. The other thing is we're looking at our internal numbers. And so Friday, we will have the COVID communicator and looking at the impact in our schools. Some of our schools have had uh, no uh, uh, COVID-related absences and some have had uh, most have had minimal. Uh, therefore, um, we'll be looking at that as well uh, in terms of those reports of COVID cases and making a determination regarding what we feel we should do. But if at all possible to have students in school with um, staff, we would like to be able to do that and to serve breakfast and lunch and give mental health care all of those services, if we can do it safely, we'd like to do it safely. And if we cannot, then we'll be prepared to act accordingly. Uh, so we'll keep all of that in mind, Dr. Morrison, when we bring this back uh, to the board. So again, next Thursday, there's not a board meeting, therefore we will be prepared to act based on uh, if we are in the red and, um, and uh, if we trust that if we're not, we'll be prepared for students to return back to school that following Monday. Any other questions for us regarding COVID related matters? I don't see any. Or Mr. Munoz, sorry. What more, what's, uh, can you talk to me about the impact on uh, paras and our sort of lunch food, food staff and anybody else, other staff and what might be in, in what, might, what might they expect? In regards to uh, the um, remote learning uh, and what that looks like, uh, Mr. Robbins can talk a little bit about food service and as it relates to uh, paras for remote learning. Previously, uh, when students uh, were learning remotely, paras were uh, teaching remotely as well. Often they are joined, uh, joining a student's classroom uh, or they are at the school helping prep materials for the teacher, um, or they're following a student's IEP. So that remote learning experience would continue. Related to food service, if we have to move into a remote setting, can you share what that would look like uh, as it would look much like it did previously when we were remote learning? Yes, Dr. Anderson, uh, you're correct about that. Uh, it'll look much like it did previously. Uh, we will be preparing uh, lunches and breakfasts uh, and five uh, base kitchens uh, across the district. Uh, then we will be trucking uh, those uh, prepared uh, meals to uh, different sites uh, across the district uh, for distribution. Uh, most of the time we'll be preparing to have meals uh, seven days worth that students would be able to pick up uh, for both uh, lunch and breakfast uh, at those uh, sites that we have predetermined. So uh, it would probably be approximately uh, 10 to 11 sites uh, like I said, and served by five base kitchens. Thank you. If there are no other questions about the COVID planning, I will share as the segue to our, and I will uh, stop there and I will share as our segue for our DCAC, uh, they, uh, and I have to thank them, they helped look over the uh, letter that we sent to families. So we've had DCAC help uh, kind of look at that letter to families to make sure it was family friendly and how it was 
uh, worded, but we also talked about remote learning and they shared that they felt uh, really good. The off the ones that I spoke with last night felt really good about the in-person learning and strongly encouraged that if we can remain in person, that we do that. So as we're taking into consideration those uh, various feedback points, um, again, our hope is to uh, remain in person. On that note, as a segue, uh, DCAC is here this evening, uh, prepared to present and ask for your approval. So you have information and action down this evening related to DCAC. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Mickelson and members of the Board of Education, I'm Ivan Gruder. I am president of the District Citizens Advisory Council, and I'm a parent of two students at Topeka High School and guardian of a second grade student at Meadows Elementary. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board tonight and for our historic partnership between the Board of Education and parents, guardians, students, and community members on DCAC. As representatives, we are here tonight to request your permission to proceed with our 2020-21 study topic, which is required by our constitution and bylaws. I would like to introduce the DCAC study coordinator, Sean Guile, and turn over the microphone so he can share with you our presentation and recommendation. Mr. Gow, we're not able to hear you or seeing if that's on our end. Or Sorry, you... no, nope, it was on my end. I had double muted myself, I apologize. Um, thank you for your time this evening. DCAC is a group that has been around for 45 years now supporting the Board of Education in a number of areas. And uh, one of the areas that we do is we study topics that the board has said they want more in-depth knowledge from the parents and the community. And that's what I'm here to talk to you tonight about is your, our request to you to approve our new study topic. The study topic, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. That's fine. Thank you. The study topic this year was developed over the summer with consultations between DCAC, the school board leadership and the administration. And we are recommending that the study topic for DCAC be mental health services for students amid and after a pandemic. We feel that mental health is one of the items that is stressed the most right now with the situation. And we think we can add value to the administration and the board with insight and research into what other districts are doing, finding best practices. And in the end, we will bring back to you a report with recommendations and historically, the board has received those very positively, and there have been a number of recommendations over time accepted. Um, and I know several board members have actually served on DCAC prior to joining the board. And so today we are just here to present to you our proposed topic of mental health services for students amid and after a pandemic and request that the board authorize the study to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Guile um, and Mr. Dr. Gruder. I, I hope it's after the pandemic that you can focus on um, by the time you give your report. Um, so we have a, a proposal to uh, ac accept this recommendation for the DCAC study topic. Um, and it is an action item. So um, I'll entertain a motion to, to do that. Mr. President, I move the board approve the DCAC study topic as presented. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Ms. Mrs. Bully offers a second. Is there any discussion on this? Dr. Morrison. Um, it, it's very apropos. I, we thank you guys for the suggestion. I hope <laughs> that we can look at the mental health service after the pandemic. I'm, I'm not sure we'll be in a position for you guys to look at uh, uh, mental health services, be, there may not be an after pandemic uh, while you're looking into this, but um, I hope that's the case. Yeah, I do too. Any other uh, questions or comments for Dr. Gruder or Mr. Guile? Just uh, 
I don't see any, but I want to just make a comment and thank you for your efforts. I know um, I attended your virtually attended your meeting last month, and I know your next meeting is scheduled for next Tuesday. And um, if people want to log on, I'm sure I don't know who from our board is scheduled to participate. Um, it's Reverend Williams. Okay. And, and he had to leave early tonight, so um, we'll make sure he's aware of it and doesn't forget it. But uh, Mr. Munoz? Yeah, my question is, what is the timeline as you begin now to, if we go forward on this topic, what's your timeline in terms of gathering information and when this report might be done? The report will be finished and presented this spring. It's uh, typically done at the May meeting. Um, it, it's, uh, is the normal schedule. We could certainly um, look at uh, the possibility of some sort of interim, but really by the time we do our research and uh, focus in, it really takes us till the spring to really put that together. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions before we vote? I don't see any, so Mrs. Lister, we're ready to vote to adopt the DCAC study topic for this year. I don't see it on my... There, we've got it now. Looks like it just popped up. The motion carries. Uh, so thank you for your leadership on the DCAC and uh, we'll look forward to hearing that report in the spring. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very Anderson. much. And thank you to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Gray and the administration for all of the assistance they give to DCAC. Thank you, Dr. Gruder. I will share that um, as our DCAC member, uh, Mr. Guile, who helped with the uh, letter uh, yesterday evening and Mrs. Routsong and others, um, I, I was going to mention the major maintenance is gonna be delayed, but since Mr. Guile is on the screen and to your question, Mr. Morrison, regarding uh, the uh, extension of the remote, just, uh, from as a DCAC representative, any thoughts on that topic from Dr. Gruder or uh, Mr. Guile, if I may, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mickelson, uh, just since they are here this evening to chime in on their thoughts about that because they uh, certainly don't mind giving their thoughts to me uh, on these topics. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, as a parent I've and as a member of DCAC, I've received uh, concerns that the community help the school district uh, stay out of the red and that we stay in school. Uh, I think that in school learning is the best for our students. Uh, and as a parent and guardian who would have three kids and people at school all online at the same time, I would simply ask, please keep them in school as much as possible. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it's the, the in-person learning is important. Um, and the district has shown that they've got methods to handle and keep things under control within the buildings. We need to get the message out to the community. We're in danger of going into the remote stage. We need the community's help to remain in the classroom and that that's a topic that the community must help us with and the district we have a responsibility as a community of educators, and I include parents in that community. We have a duty to get that message out. And uh, we're very supportive of the work that's being done and uh, hope we can get the numbers back where they need to be. And as pastor of Westside Baptist Church, I volunteered every day the entire time we were doing remote uh, since March all the way through doing food service. And I can tell you that food service and food distribution and the mental health services students get in school is incredibly important. And missing that one day, two days, or even three days uh, is, is detrimental to their health. And so just not only education is important, but the social services and the emotional support they get in schools is important. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, their mention has been of the broadband. Um, that is an area of concern. And it's a big enough area of concern 
the District Citizens Advisory Council has actually formed an advocacy group on broadband whose purpose is to assist the district and the community in advocating for expanded broadband availability within not just the district, but within the region. And I thank you both for your uh, support and work. And uh, we certainly hope to continue to provide in-school services um, as much as possible uh, as it's safe to do so. Uh, the major maintenance we attached for you, Mr. Sykes is looking forward to coming next time to talk with you because we knew it'd be a late hour this evening and he wants your full attention at the next meeting. So the plan is actually just posted so members of the public can see that and comment on that, but uh, he'll be speaking at the next time. The one legislative voice proposal that is also posted is uh, at this point, uh, just a point of uh, information, I won't be asking you to act on it until the next meeting. So I've just given it to you so you have it. The changes to the proposal for those members that are new, one voice is uh, represents all of Shawnee County superintendents having one voice and one legislative agenda that we together present as a team. Um, they are still taking the proposal to their boards as well. If there are things that you'd like for us to consider to add to the proposal, it is your legislative agenda. I just get the pleasure of presenting it and often there is a board member uh, or board president there in the audience. Uh, but myself and the other superintendents present this. The changes I will share with you, it's generally the same each year, but this year, the additions that we've discussed, which we're unsure if the other board members uh, at, in the other districts will uh, be in support of, but uh, I'm asking for your consideration when I bring it back at the next meeting to consider adding broadband as a topic, to consider adding supporting COVID related resources as a topic, and to consider adding expansion of Medicaid services as a legislative uh, platform as well as a potential topic uh, pending um, the agreement from other boards across the county. Those are the three large areas that we have uh, added. Um, so again, next meeting, I'll bring that back and get your input. Those are all the things that we have for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. So uh, that one legislative voice proposal will go before all the boards of education in Shawnee County and we collectively will submit that to the legislative legislators that represent our district. So we'll have an action item next week or in two weeks. Next in the agenda is board member comments. Dr. Bonebreak, do you have any comments for us tonight? I can't, would you turn on your microphone? I can't hear you very well. Thank you. I don't want to sing the Texas sidestep that Charles Durning did in Best Little Whorehouse of Texas, but it's just hard to keep sidestepping everything. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Dr. Morrison. Um, not much to say. I, I think that the district is on top of the COVID thing. And I, I don't know if the, the the parents are still uh, listening, and I do realize it's very important to keep kids in school, and I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but I also see it from my daughter, who's working in the ICU at Stormont Vale, and is seeing all these very sick people and um, some dying. So uh, you have to look at it from both ways, we have to mitigate. And I think we're doing a great job of mitigating the virus, but it may just be uncontrollable uh, before long, who knows. Uh, but we do ask for the help of all the people in Shawnee County uh, to wear masks, say social distance, wash your hands, do the things and don't politicize it, just do them. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, we are ex officio members of DTI, and I would like to pass that on to somebody else at this point. They have no meetings in um, November and December because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. 
Um, but if somebody's interested in being and what that involves is just going online to the meetings. And, and when do they meet, have those meetings? And they, they meet the last Thursday of the month at, I think it's about, I think it's 8.30 in the morning. And all you do, uh, you bring up, I, I've brought up a couple of topics that are important to 501, but it really <laughs> doesn't involve us very much. It's just kind of a watch um, because some of the things they do would decrease our tax base. And we would lose money, um, and so they they do like to ask us questions sometimes. But at, so far, I've never been asked. <laughs> but I have volunteered, so I just want Scott. Uh, if, if somebody's interested in in sitting in those meetings, I mean, it's just once a month, and it's virtually nothing. A good good opportunity to be involved and understand what's happening sure. with with our community. So if somebody is interested, they can get with Dr. Morrison and learn more about it and the details of that. And we will continue to keep that on the agenda or keep that on the radar so we can find a replacement for you. Thank you for your service there. Mr. Mr. Munoz. You know, again, I wanted to uh, highlight and congratulate uh, Javier uh, Noriega, who was uh, our senior of the month. Uh, it's a big, uh, you know, it's a big honor uh, to, to highlight our students who are doing uh, incredibly well, uh, who are involved and who are excelling. Um, in addition, you know, given the circumstances, it's it's amazing what he's done, and I look forward to see what he where he goes down the future. Um, and the other thing is, I just I want to um, say that uh, we we appreciate and we we see the hard work that's uh, being done, both by our administration as well as our teachers, paras, uh, custodians, um, all of our staffs in our schools. Uh, they are bending over backwards and 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 cr creating an environment where our kids can learn where we know that they they belong. Um, and, and the last thing I wanna say is that, as has been said before, uh, to our community members, that things are, 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 are perilous. They, they really are dangerous and, and it's reflected in, in today's announcement of, of uh, the transmission rate. And, and we do need to everybody's uh, support and, and for everyone to be on the same page in terms of making sure that we, we do our part to make sure our kids are able to continue to, to be in school and learning and, and growing like we need them to. So thank you. This is Bully. I want to thank our uh, Topeka Public School family for trusting our administration to keep them safe and to make these tough decisions for our students and for them. And I'm, I just really appreciate their patience. I, I know that this is a really hard year for everyone. And I wanna thank them for being very patient and trusting of us. I also wanted to state to our teachers out there or any of our educators that the Dr. Watson presented to the State Board of Education and was expressing to them how hard it is out there for teachers. Teachers have been contacting and talking about the struggles that they have this year. And the uh, school board, the state school board is planning on putting a commission together to try to find how they can help support teachers and possibly find ways that uh, can take some of the stress off of them because they are highly concerned as we are as a school board, as our administration is, we're highly concerned about our teachers at this period of time. And we just don't even know how to tell them how much we appreciate them. I also wanted to say congratulations to the first KTPS TV presentation that came on. And what an exciting thing to watch where they give news of the district and a student does it and their presentation abilities that they're learning. It was just really wonderful. Um, congratulations to them. Also the National FFA grant. Topeka is right smack in the middle of rural America and many students don't know where our food comes from. And to have an FFA here where students are learning about agriculture, how powerful is that at our TCALC building? So I'm really excited about that. A thank you for the Topeka Community Foundation 
for finding extra screens, buying extra screens for our teachers during this remote learning time. What a great and wonderful gift to our district th to thank them. Briggs Kia for finding pumpkins for our um, children so that they have some normalcy and Nola Ford for the uniforms at our early college prep academy. Every student has a uniform now that they got a t-shirt and pants and and um, where they are dressing professionally to, to present themselves. And you know, probably the most important, congratulations to Topeka High, that's why I wore my mask. I saw they had a 7.7% increase in their graduation rate. That is a tremendous accomplishment. It is something we should just celebrate. A very and, and our other schools as well, Capital City, Hope Street, Avondale West. I happen to be lucky enough to be a friend with Mrs. Morrissey. And she and I've sat down a couple of times to talk about her plans for her staff and her students and increasing that graduation rate, gradu graduation rate. And I just want to say congratulations to her. She's fulfilling her goals, her professional goals. And that was really a wonderful thing. Last thing, I wanted to thank Mrs. Uh, Norman for inviting me to her Halloween celebration to judge Halloween doors, um, something that was fun for the teachers. And how much curriculum was embedded in the, the decorations. So I had a great time. Sorry, I'm running out of breath behind this mask. <laughs> But thank you for inviting me, Mrs. Norman. Ms. Stuart Campbell. Since the last board meeting, I've been able to visit Robinson Middle School, Eisenhower Middle, Eisenhower Middle School, and Highland Park High School. Uh, my goal is to visit one school a week. One school a week. And the, the, the purpose in visiting the schools is to just check in on people, see how staff are doing, see how students are doing, and also to assure them that the board, we are here to listen to them, hear their concerns, we care. And it's, it's really, I'm really glad I have the opportunity to, to do these school visits. Um, so I'm also sure to ask the staff what and students, um, what we can do to better support them. And one thing that I have heard some at the middle schools is that there's, we're still having some challenge of midday transportation. And so I don't know what the answer is during these hard times. I just wanted to state that, that it's, it's still, um, it is just an issue for some kids getting them to school. So I, I urge parents, the community, just if to help arrange with carpooling or perhaps in some hardship cases. I don't know if, if TPS can, can help like kids who are within the less than the two mile radius if they can still in hardship cases. Like I heard a story of, of a kid who lives like 1.3 miles away, um, a middle school student, but he, he couldn't get to school because he had to cross a highway. He just couldn't get to school. So anyway, I don't know if that's possible, how we could help with that, you know, and still adhere to all the COVID precautions on, on the bus because I know that's a huge, huge consideration. Um, but I was really impressed. I have to say, I had a, I had a great time. And Ms. Bully talking about um, embedding curriculum. So I, at Eisenhower, I had the privilege of attending a class that did this whole Day of the Dead celebration. And it was project-based. It was, it was amazing, just all the different um, content that was embedded in that teacher's lesson, really cool. So I was really impressed by how the, the staff, the students were all following COVID precautions and teaching was happening, learning was happening and just a, there was an upbeat attitude. So just an overall I can attitude. And I just, I, I left those buildings just feeling uplifted. So I look forward to next week's school.
So you'll find out about that at the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stewart Campbell. Um, just very briefly, um, Mrs. Wallace um, is chair, or she coordinates the calendar committee. So we plan the calendar several years in advance and that committee met last night at 4.30 and we'll meet hopefully the next uh, two Wednesdays at 4.30, typically for an hour or so. She runs a very efficient committee and they put a proposal or two or three out to the teachers which who then vote on which one they prefer and um, lay out the pros and cons and the teachers are able to dissect out that out and figure out which one they prefer. So if uh, I know Ms. Boley went to that committee meeting last night, thank you for doing that on I think short notice probably. Um, but if there's anyone else who'd like to learn more about how the calendar is created, then please let me know um, the next two Wednesdays at 4.30 if you check your calendars. Um, Ms. Boley. That's right. So it's a it's a committee made up of our entire staff, not only just certified teachers. So um, very efficient committee. And, and when I've done it for the last six or seven years, it seems like so. Um, but if somebody wants to learn that, this is a wonderful way to figure out the ins and outs. And um, there's a lot of complexity that you don't take into account when you think about it. But in each year is different. It would be easy if you just say, okay, on August 15th, we're going to do this, but it's not that simple. Um, the second thing, just very briefly, I did visit uh, Whitson and Randolph last Friday after it was the end of the Halloween day. And by the time I got there and visited with them, they were both principals reported very successful Halloween events and um, safe. And they felt like kids were having fun and it was educational at the same time. So um, thank those principals for hosting me very briefly. Um, with that, we'll adjourn the meeting.